Welcome everybody. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar, Strategies for Supporting Attendance and Student Engagement During COVID-19. My name is Gwen Young and I'm Student Services Specialist at VDOE. And just a few, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, first of all, I wanna thank Sarah Baysmore our School Counseling Specialist and Student Assistance Systems Coordinator for helping to facilitate this webinar. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and due to capacity limitations with Zoom, we are also live streaming this on YouTube. Uh, for those joining through Zoom, you will be able to submit questions into the chat box and we will have a, a Q&A session um, at the end of this webinar. So to get started, I know that um, we can all agree that this year has been really challenging and uncertain. Um, between the pandemic and the civil unrest, um, amidst all of this, um, you know, with the uh, con continuity in education in the spring and then schools reopening in um, this fall, there's just been a lot of uncertainties and trying to figure out what our students need um, between going virtual um, trying to figure out the different phases of reopening. And even now, um, as a number of cases of COVID surge, um, I know that some school divisions have had to pull back their plans for um, returning to school in person. So we've all really had to do things very differently. And it's now even more important than ever to really make sure that we um, are engaging our students and know where they are and be able to support them. Um, and it's really important to, um, you know, because we've had to do things so differently to, to really be creative. And I thought that this um, webinar would be a great opportunity for us to really learn from each other and hear about the different practices across the state that is really aimed at supporting students and families during these trying times. So, um, So today, what we'll do is we'll begin with some remarks from Dr. Leslie Sales from VDOE, and then we'll go right into um, sharing the efforts across the, across the state from several different school divisions, Norfolk Public Schools, Hampton City Schools, Montgomery County Public Schools, and Richmond City Public Schools. We'll follow that up with um, some information from the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services um, looking at um, uh, diversionary practices, and then we'll follow that up with some, um, some questions and answers. Um, what I'd like to do is if we can um, collect the questions as we go along, um, but we will not pose them at the end of each of the presenters, but we'll wait until the very end of the webinar and we'll ask all those questions at the same time. So today I'm very happy to have Leslie J Sale join us. Dr. Sales joined the Office of Policy um, in the Virginia Department of Education in 2019, bringing with her a range of academic and nonprofit experience in political science, public policy, and community engagement, uh, engagement work. Leslie stepped into the director role of the Office of Policy earlier this year. So Dr. Les Dr. Sale, we'd love to have you join us. Good morning, and let me go ahead and get my slides queued up for everyone. And can everyone see that? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to start just by thanking um, my colleagues at the Department of Education for, for hosting this important event um, and allowing me a few minutes of, of your precious time this morning um, to provide a little bit of context um, for attendance as a policy concept, um, as well as a tool that we've used in years past and, and how kind of this year has really reframed how we're thinking attendance from the state level. And then, of course, that's really translated to some creative practices at the local level, which we'll hear from our other presenters later in the morning more about those. Um, I think probably the, the most natural place to start is just revisiting what attendance has meant to us in years past, both as again, a, a policy concept, as well as a, a, a data tool um, for, for us in, in accreditation and, and compliance and all of that. 
So attendance has really been a, a multifaceted concept um, in, in years past and prior to 2020 and 2021. Um, and it's played a, a, a lot of different, wore a lot of different hats, I guess I should say rather. Um, one of the big ones that we know attendance serves a function for is, is helping us remain compliant with our compulsory attendance laws in Virginia. So making sure all of those students of, of school age range are enrolled in some sort of educational program and, and coming to school as required of them. Um, and then of course, as, a, as kind of a seg from that, um, collecting attendance data was also a way to support our truancy officers. So those folks doing the, the important and difficult work of, of making sure that every school and or every student in the Commonwealth, um, again, is, is engaged in some sort of educational programming. Um, of course, as I know, many counselors on the call already know this. It's also an important gauge for us in terms of student well-being. Um, if students aren't attending school or, or participating kind of sparsely or intermittently, um, that can often be an indication that there's there's something bigger going on with that student, um, whether that be in the classroom or outside of the classroom. So it's an important tool for us in that space. Um, we also use attendance um, in establishing our school divisions of, of ADM count, so average daily membership, um, which is particularly important for our schools and divisions um, as it drives or division funding. Um, so that's a, a pretty important component of attendance for us. Um, and then most recently with the update to the standards of accreditation that were implemented in the 2018-2019 school year, um, attendance has also become a proxy for student engagement. Um, and that's particularly notable as it informs our chronic absenteeism indicator in the standards of accreditation and in our accreditation models, which I know many of you are, are already well familiar with and, and well versed in. Um, so with all of that, um, I know that it, it has to look a little bit different this school year. And as we um, you know, settle into the school year and kind of really understand the, the role that attendance plays for us, um, we know that there were a few challenges that we were going to be up against this year. Um, you know, first and foremost, and I think probably the most obvious for us is that um, with, with fewer face-to-face -face interactions and with many of our divisions and schools going entirely remotely, um, the way that we used to track attendance through that face-to-face -face engagement and actually physically seeing our students um, wasn't as much as an option or as, as readily available of an option as it has been in years past. <clears throat> And then, of course, there was also the variability in our instructional models across the state. Um, and so that meant that as we were troubleshooting how divisions should, should approach and understand attendance in the 2020-21 school year, there was no single answer um, and really no single answer even within divisions that, um, you know, the, the way that we were handling instruction across divisions looked differently. Um, and then, of course, the way we were handling instruction for, for individual student populations looked differently. And so that also translated to how we were calculating and looking at attendance for these populations. So with that in mind, as we approach the 2020-2021 school year, um, the state has issued some guidance to the division to, to really think about um, how we think about attendance in this year and centering the, the key functions and the role that we think attendance can play, knowing the challenges and obstacles that we were up against with this unique and unprecedented um, environment and educational structure. Um, so one of the things that, that we knew we had to keep in place, of course, we need to, to, to maintain our compulsory attendance laws and, and make sure our truancy officers are able to do their work. Um, and then, of course, we want to make sure our school divisions are receiving the, the ample funding for all of the students that they have in their classroom. Um, so, you know, having those daily attendance figures translate to, to ADM was an important component of that. Um, but the most important, and I think the biggest for, for us at the state level, was making sure that we were checking in on student well-being. Um, you know, this year, I guess being a most exemplary in terms of a need for checking in the student well-being, especially knowing that we have a variety of, of different stressors and different anxieties for our students this year as they adapt to new and evolving instructional modalities, but also tackle you know, life challenges and life circumstances that um, many of our students have never had to face before. And so um, attendance as, as making sure that we, we know what's happening in our students' lives and we're supporting with them became particularly pointed and important this year. So with those key functions in mind, um, we provided some, some creative solutions to both tracking daily attendance, um, but also putting at the center of this maintaining meaningful, meaningful interactions with our students. Um, so using those meaningful interactions, and by that we mean really that two-way engagement with our students. So we have an opportunity to hear from them, understand what's 
what's on their minds, um, the things that they're feeling good about, the things that they're struggling with, um, and really be able to kind of adapt and understand um, their, their individual experience right now. Um, and that's, of course, embedded in the larger attendance model. Um, so making sure we, again, have those compliance metrics as well as checking in on our student well-being. Um, and so with that, the state guidance had also provided some, some examples and some suggestions of thinking about attendance in ways that we haven't in years past. Um, so again, whereas we used to rely on our face-to-face -face interactions and be able to know when a, a student is in a seat for a course or for during the day, um, didn't have those same luxuries this year. So we needed to think about attendance in not only time-based ways, um, and of course there was a wider range of thinking about time-based solution and attendance tracking in the virtual environment, but we could also think about task-based um, solutions for attendance. And that means knowing that our students are participating and engaging with us through things like work products um, or, or check-ins or things like that. Um, so all in all, and in short, it was really kind of a, a way to, to think creatively about um, attendance in the, in the 2020 and 2021 school year. Um, and hopefully, um, I'm sure our school divisions will talk more about how that's translated to, to practice at the, the local school division level. So lastly, from a policy perspective, I know when we're talking about creativity, sometimes we can feel a little confounded by those rules that are on the books um, and those things that have kind of driven our practices in the way that we've done things in the past. Um, so two of the things that we have issued in terms of policy waivers um, for this year, and this was via authority provided to the superintendent of public instruction through the executive order on declaring a state of emergency, as well as budget language that got added to the budget in the April session, um, was that we were able to provide a little bit of flexibility for school divisions to really get to those creative solutions. Um, the first part is we waived one of the components um, of the um, of our regulatory language, um, which is uh, issued by our Board of Education, which talks about when you count a student present. Um, and as you can see there from the language is that that's not perfectly applicable for, for our in instructional environment at the moment. Um, so we waive that requirement again to allow for, for some creative thought in how we're tracking attendance and making sure our students are engaged. And then secondly, and probably the, the, the biggest component, uh, is that we waived accreditation for the 2021-2020 school year. Um, and, and the accreditation school year map is a, is a little unique. So that means that applies to the data that we're collecting for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, and so although, you know, tracking attendance and, and measuring uh, absenteeism is an important tool for us, again, from, from making sure that our students are, are getting the support and help that they need to be successful this year, um, it will not be a part of the, the accreditation model um, and be reflected in accreditation rankings for the 2021-2020 school year based on this year's data. Um, so with that being said, I, I think that, again, that's the context for, for how we were, we were considering and, and rethinking attendance at the state level, and of course, making sure that we gave our local school divisions the operational space that they need uh, to really support our students this year. So I will hand it back to our, our host. Sorry about that. Um, so now we'll hear from Sophia Almond. Sophia is the senior coordinator with Norfolk Public City Schools. I'm sorry, Norfolk Public Schools in Norfolk, Virginia. Some of her division <coughs> responsibilities include attendance, transition support, and discipline. Sophia's educational background in psychology and special education guides her approach to her work. She believes children of all ages come to school to learn the following skills, how to interact with others, how to be a friend or maintain friendships, how to remember and apply content knowledge, and how to behave in different settings and situations beyond the four walls of the school building. Sophia also believes all parents want what is best for their children, although some of them may not have the skill sets to cultivate and nurture the best outcomes. Therefore, parent partnerships and family engagement is crucial for continuous school success. Discipline consequences are best when used as developmentally based teachable moments without judgment personal offense or anger. Poor choices and mistakes yield opportunities for individuals of all ages to learn and grow. With that, I turn this over to Sophia. Good morning, everyone. 
When asked to participate in this webinar, I expressed that I may have a few examples of how we in Norfolk Public Schools support attendance and student engagement in our virtual environment. However, I did not have too many that I could share that were being implemented division-wide. Every day we are working to keep all of our students engaged in attending school during these unprecedented times. Like many of you, we are experiencing many of the challenges Dr. Sale shared in the beginning of her presentation. With that being said, I'm going to share the examples I have with you now. I will begin by highlighting <clears throat> some of the efforts supporting our English learners or L population. The teachers and staff of the English as a Second Language Office, our ESL office, are positioned to support our Ls and their families. They promote division-wide family engagement in a variety of ways, including partnering with all division staff as a way to bring better understanding as to why connecting with L families is so important. We do not want language barriers to hinder students' access to instruction or impede daily school attendance in our virtual environment. In June 2020, L Family Engagement facilitated its first on-site safe space workshops for parents and students, followed by virtual parent chats beginning in July in preparation for the 2020-2021 school year. Since then, teachers and ESL family engagement staff have partnered with, the open, partnered with Open Norfolk to present on-site technology, share division and community resources, guide parent workshops, and provide instructional materials for students in safe, accessible outdoor venues. Additionally, teachers and ESL family engagement staff have set up on-site parent pickup stations at sc student schools during the day to distribute student supplies such as headsets, whiteboards, and Chromebooks. They've taken it part in neighborhood events by providing resource tables and many technology tutorials during information sessions as outreach at outreach programs and health fairs. They've held a town hall where L parents were invited to speak with division administrators about remote learning concerns. They've rolled out division-wide use of voyance language interpretation services. <clears throat> they continue to schedule parent, student, teacher meet and greet opportunities, host virtual sessions during evenings and weekends, schedule pop-up outdoor sessions to discuss how to access information, connect with Norfolk Public Schools online platforms such as Canvas and Zoom in safe and accessible locations, complete home visits, create videos in Spanish, gather data from exit surveys to assess additional needs and trends for reattendees, and work with teachers and staff to reach and teach students. ESL family engagement staff will be holding family engagement and cultural climate staff training this month in December. By taking all of these proactive actions, staff supporting our L students and families gain trust within their communities, which promotes positive attendance and student engagement. During these unprecedented times, we've discovered the need to do more than what we usually do to reach our students and families. During the first couple of weeks of school, multidisciplinary groups of staff boarded school buses and rode into neighborhoods to locate and encourage students to engage in school. Numerous impromptu question and answer sessions emerged from that action. Norfolk Public Schools continues to support this action by placing a bus and driver at every school so that staff can travel into communities when needed and re-engage students when necessary. At one of our high schools, an assistant principal uses FaceTime to communicate with students. She makes telephone wake-up calls each morning and facilitates weekly informative Canvas and Zoom how-to sessions off campus from 5 to 7 p.m with meals and transportation provided for students and parents to promote independent virtual learning. At a high school, we have a clerical school's clerical specialist utilizing Facebook and other school social media platforms to connect and encourage students to attend school. She extends additional help by providing tech support, 
mentoring, or information on how to use other helpful resources. Like most school divisions, we offer, <clears throat> like most school divisions, we offer recorded instructional sessions students can access during non-traditional school hours. This increases the opportunities for students to attend school every day. A number of staff across the division engage in home visits, either physically or virtually to address students' attendance and engagement concerns. In an attempt to address some of the social emotional barriers our students and families are facing during this pandemic, school counselors and school social workers are completing these visits more than usual. Their efforts often extend beyond traditional school hours. One of our instructional technology resource teachers, our ITRTs, now spends more time speaking with students than teachers to address the common excuse, I can't log on. <clears throat> I apologize. <clears throat> the ITRT guides the students on how to complete device updates access online platforms through multiple site locations and check and resolve common technology issues. One of our middle school principals uses Zoom, Facebook, and other social media platforms to host weekly themed sessions with parents, students, and staff to encourage engagement, demonstrate a community of learners, and promote educational wellness. Building a culture and climate of community strengthens daily attendance. I created a one pager for staff and amended it for students and families to guide how we track student attendance. The Department of Learning Support Special Education Services offered a series of parent and family workshops to proactively address potential concerns and promote parent and family engagement. For each session scheduled, there were two opportunities to attend, either during the traditional lunch hour 12 to 1 or a common dinner hour, 6 to 7 p.m. These workshops helped address barriers that may impede students' daily attendance in the virtual environment. Some of the sessions for parents and guardians included <clears throat> organizational strategies for students with disabilities in a virtual environment, establishing a routine during virtual instruction, supporting behaviors, managing behaviors in a virtual environment, managing challenging behaviors in telepractice, telepractice for students with complex needs, learning at a distance with augmentative and alternative communication, and telepractice in early childhood special education. I want to end by <clears throat> encouraging attendance administrators to reach out to your colleagues. You do not have to face or figure out everything on your own. When the truancy regulations were amended and chronic absenteeism became a standard for accreditation, I reached out to administrators across Hampton Roads to find out if they were interested in meeting periodically to discuss attendance matter. Of the eight divisions I contacted, six responded. Initially, our conversations were about attendance policies, allocations of staff, regulatory truancy procedures, truancy codes and state reporting, chronic absenteeism, accreditation, et cetera. Our regional collaboration grew into a viable professional cohort concerning addressing student attendance. After the mandated closures in March, our conversation shifted. We needed to know how to navigate and promote student attendance in a virtual and or hybrid environment and provide guidance to staff in our divisions. We invited Quinn from the v Department of Education, the Virginia Department of Education to join our discussions. And we began proactively planning for the 2020-2021 school year. We share challenges and solutions, best practices and procedures, and helpful resources like good books to read to help guide and inform our practices. We discuss the importance of knowing our families and letting that knowledge <clears throat> guide our decisions <clears throat> for our divisions, identifying new barriers for our students and families, then revising existing practices, and realizing some situations that arise must be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. It is reassuring to know we have each other to talk through the parameters of those cases. 
When we meet, it is encouraging to know we have so much in common, the barriers we face and the frustration we feel, especially during these unprecedented times. The ongoing benefit of a regional collaboration is having a group of colleagues with a shared vision and purpose to talk through problematic circumstances and reach viable solutions. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Sophia. I really appreciate that. <clears throat> Up next is Tiffany Hardy. She has been a public school educator in Virginia for 26 years and currently serves as a director of student services for Hampton City Schools. Prior roles include high school principal, K through 12 curriculum leader, assistant principal, and English teacher. She has presented and led professional development at local, regional, state, and national conferences. In addition, she has served on state and national committees and task forces. Mrs. Hardy received her bachelor's in English and secondary education from the College of William Mary and her master's in educational leadership from Old Dominion University. She is currently in the final phase of her dissertation and plans to earn her PhD in educational leadership in the spring of 2021. Now I turn this over to Tiffany. Good morning, can you hear and see my presentation? All right, wonderful. Well, thank you very much everyone for your time today. Obviously you are here because your commitment to making sure we have our students present in whatever capacity that is, um, is paramount. I'm very excited to have been asked to share some of the practices that Hampton City Schools embraces, um, but I'm even more excited about the fact that as a participant today, I'm going to be learning and stealing some ideas as well. I wanna thank Quinn for coordinating this event and for supporting our regional collaboration. This is truly a great opportunity for reflection and sharing that leads to innovation, continual growth, um, and the increased potential to provide an equitable access to all of our children. Under the leadership of our superintendent, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Smith, our school division's practices are rooted in systems approaches, um, as well as commitment to equity. In terms of our attendance practices, our mission is to implement processes and best practices that will break down barriers that are impeding access to education for our most vulnerable students. Schools exist to educate our children and help them to grow, but we can't do that unless that we can give them access to learning experiences that are so critical. And they're even more critical now than ever before. Throughout the past two years, we have had three critical areas of focus that we've maintained relative to attendance and equitable access for our students. As we moved into a whole new context this spring and fall, we relied on these critical uh, focuses as, as a way to ensure that we weren't going to be losing any of our students. And we know now that many of our children are on virtual and only a few grade levels are back in a face-to-face -face format. The potential to lose our children is greater and we have to be more concerted in our efforts and we have to be creative in how we meet the needs of our families. I will talk first uh, briefly about the culture and then move into some of the specific actionable things that we prioritize in Hampton City Schools. The foundation of effective practice is school and organizational culture. The systems we create are only as effective as the individuals who implement them. If individuals don't share common beliefs and values, then there won't be consistency or fidelity and the system breaks down. So we work directly with our school leaders to help them establish a shared understanding relative to the significance of student attendance as it relates to academics, social emotional development, behavior, and potential for future success. The schools that work on this consistently have greater success regardless of the challenges and barriers that the student population faces. Our Director of Culture and Climate, Heather Peterson, works with each school's climate coach to build social emotional learning approaches that are essential for creating that physically and emotionally welcoming and safe environment in the school and the classrooms. The student services team works directly with school attendance teams to help them cultivate shared responsibility among all staff related to attendance. 
A systems approach is essential to ensure consistency and a logical flow of information and action. Without a systems approach, actions and efforts can be haphazard, kind of hit or miss, and then certain students benefit, but not all. And that's how our most vulnerable students tend to fall through the cracks. Working backward from the desired goal of access for every child, we defined each phase in the system necessary to identify and address barriers to access. The first phase of the system speaks to school culture and foundations that meet students' social and emotional needs. If this does not exist, then there are many students likely to have attendance issues. In order to narrow the volume of students who need the more targeted and intensive supports, the foundations are essential. We had to establish this formally to help create a collective understanding that student attendance is not just about marking a student absent or present. It's much greater than that. And it's very complex, which is why the systems and responses to student attendance need to be equally complex. We really can't assume that absences are a result of laziness or a lack of concern for education. Often absences are a symptom of significant variables or barriers in their lives. We really had to focus on shifting the mindset to realize that absenteeism is a leading indicator that something is wrong that needs and can be addressed. We develop structured data analysis systems to help school attendance teams, or as we call them, combating chronic absenteeism or CCA teams to do their work. Those CCA teams work to identify and address absenteeism concerns early. Without this step, too many students are absent for lengthy periods of time before intervention and support is provided. As the volume of, in, of absences increase for an individual student, the likelihood of re-engaging them decreases. So early intervention and identification are absolutely critical. We've trained our administrators on how to facilitate root cause analysis in order to identify the barriers to attendance and then align the specific interventions and supports necessary to address those barriers. Addressing barriers can help to level the playing field and increase access for our disadvantaged students. As part of the process, they develop individualized corrective action plans. Without this step, schools were working hard, but they weren't making a lot of headway for students who have intensive barriers. This has been essential this year, given the added barriers, including technology, internet access, family work schedules and supervision, home dynamics, space for learning, resources, job loss, financial strains, food shortage, et cetera. As with many of the challenges related to the global pandemic, many families really could not prepare for a virtual learning platform. We've had to focus on how to mitigate the impact of those new barriers on our families. The corrective action plan, a structured plan that follows a prescribed protocol, helps to address barriers and the process continues from there to include ongoing monitoring. We have to monitor to ensure that, that the plan is still working because sometimes circumstances change. And in this pandemic, circumstances change quickly for families and new barriers arise. Each school's CCA team examines their attendance data weekly to monitor attendance for previously identified at-risk students, as well as to identify if there are new attendance concerns that need to be addressed. Once we establish the comprehensive system of care for attendance, then we establish specific division and school level protocols. These are daily and weekly actions essential to ensuring that student needs are identified and addressed. Each school has designated an attendance officer who is the point of contact for parents and for guardians. He or she is responsible for updating daily attendance records, for checking that teachers have submitted attendance for each class, rectifying discrepancies in attendance between daily and class attendance, and running critical reports for the CCA team. We defined the daily and weekly workflow to avoid missing steps in the process because gaps in a system are where our most vulnerable students fall. The CCA team at each school includes several core individuals as well as additional personnel based on the staffing and the school level. An administrator, attendance officer, counselor, nurse are standard for each team. Some teams also include family engagement specialists, community li liaisons, base workers, 
grad specialists, teachers, and school social workers. Their work focuses on chronic absenteeism as well as truancy. The school level team identifies students who reach key levels of absenteeism and truancy. They discuss specific supports relative to truancy, medical concerns, technology access, family needs, et cetera. And they identify who will work directly with each student and family. If a student continues to have attendance concerns or needs more support than the school can provide, then the family and the student are referred to a district level team for intensive community supports. In order to leverage personnel and resources, the combating chronic absenteeism teams tier their students based on their attendance data, including both chronic absenteeism and truancy. Tier one includes all students. Universal practices include attendance contracts, parent information resources and videos, automated attendance calls, culture of shared responsibility and a welcoming environment anchored in social emotional practices. Tier two includes students who have three or more unexcused absences or 10 or more total absences. Interventions include in-person calls, home visits to try and problem solve attendance concerns, parenting workshops and attendance recovery opportunities. Tier three students include those who have more than six unexcused absences or greater than or equal to 10% total absence. Those students receive an appropriate level of response including a behavior intervention plan, a corrective action plan, a social work referral, or referral to the multi-agency truancy response team. Continuing with our systems approach, we developed a protocol years ago and have continued to refine it and, and make sure that it reflects the new context that we're working in, especially under COVID and a nearly 100% virtual environment. The truancy protocol is called HERE, and it identifies what's going to happen for each student at the school as well as division levels for individual students as they reach those critical levels of truancy. We use an automated calling system to notify families at the first and second unexcused absences. At the third unexcused absence, a personal call is made to parents and guardians to discuss the absences, the attendance policy, the impact of absence on the student development, rectify attendance that maybe wasn't reported properly or documented and identify potential barriers. At the fourth unexcused absence, another contact is made and it may also include a home visit. This year, our school resource officers have been a tremendous resource in our work relative to attendance. They're making home visits to our families of truant and no-show students. It's been a valuable partnership with the Hampton Police Division because the school resource officers have approached these visits as an opportunity to support and build positive working relationships with our families in our community. At the fifth unexcused absence, an administrator meets with the family to conduct a corrective action plan. These meetings have occurred in person in the past, but now are on Zoom or by phone, and in some cases during home visits. The corrective action meeting includes analysis of a student's academic, attendance, behavior, and social emotional profile, root cause analysis of barriers to attendance, and action planning specific to address the barriers. If the corrective action plan and school supports aren't enough, as I shared, the family is referred to our truancy response team. Our student support specialists, Sean MacGyver and Shayla Woodard, facilitate this multi-agency team to problem solve with the family. Additional supports are provided by the community agencies represented on the team. You've heard the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it truly, our Hampton village or community embraces attendance more than ever before. Representatives from court services unit, school social work, department of social services, healthy families, Hampton Newport News Community Services Board, and the Family Assistance and Planning Team collaborate directly with Hampton City Schools to address attendance needs and concerns for our most at-risk families and students. Intervention teams include the family and they craft a more intensive intervention support plan. Healthy Families offers parenting workshops to help our families learn about the importance of school attendance and learn strategies for supporting their children in the home. These workshops offer students absence forgiveness as well. And our Hampton City Schools stakeholder team, facilitated by the Honorable Jay Duggar, Chief District Court Judge for the Juvenile and Domestic Relations Court, meets to discuss services and resources that are available, as well as unique cases that need additional supports. This has been critical this year 
in light of the new barriers we cannot always anticipate related to the pandemic and virtual learning. The schools are where the heavy lifting really occurs, but they need ongoing and embedded support to implement systems with fidelity and effectiveness. A comprehensive stakeholder team, including administrators, teachers, counselors, nurses, school social workers, parents, and central office staff, develop the parameters and procedures for student attendance for the 100% virtual and hybrid models. This ensured we anticipated a variety of scenarios, challenges, and questions, and took into consideration the perspective of all of our stakeholders. We communicated the relevant information to school leaders, teachers, school staff, attendance officers, and families through deliverables, flyers, training, webinars, and videos. Our office provides ongoing training, face-to-face, -face, Zoom, and through videos to school administrators, attendance designees, deans, and our combating co chronic absenteeism teams to assist with school-based procedures and workflow, data reporting and analysis, student tracking, root cause analysis, and corrective action planning are all parts of the ongoing training support we provide. Also part of that ongoing support, we provide structured feedback on corrective action plans developed by the schools to help the school leaders continue to grow in their skills and understanding of root cause analysis, available interventions, and alignment of interventions based on the needs of the families. We've also provided resources such as a reflective matrix to help our school teams evaluate and improve their practices. We've also provided tracking models, corrective action plan exemplars, bi-weekly attendance data audits on chronic absenteeism and truancy, as well as here actions, monthly exit reports to ensure that every student who exits Hampton City Schools is tracked until he or she officially enrolls in another school division or a state. We are committed to ensuring we don't lose a single child now or in the future. Attendance often reflects inherent inequities that exist within society. COVID like major disasters and challenges impacts our disadvantaged and vulnerable family, families disproportionately. To counterbalance the impact, we set out to identify potential barriers and align specific supports early. We've seen an increase in access issues as a result of homelessness, poverty and job loss, lack of supervision due to family work schedules, trauma related to domestic violence, abuse, community crime, mental health issues related to isolation, family and home dynamics, and of course, technology, including both internet access and a lack of familiarity with the technologies on which our students are now completely dependent. We fixed our focus this year on leveraging our existing systems and identifying specific supports that would help to mitigate the barriers created or intensified by COVID and the virtual learning platform. Equity is about tipping the scale back toward balance for the individual. And the supports have to be personalized based on the barriers the individual family and student are facing. There is no one size fits all solution. Our technology department increased Chromebook inventory to provide a device to every child K through 12. They also created technology and internet assistance teams to address internet access issues. Through a partnership with Cox Communications, families are eligible for reduced or free internet access based on their socioeconomic status. Schools intensified home visits to include the school resource officers and security officers, in addition to existing personnel already committed to the work with the students, such as our nurses, our counselors, our teachers and administrators. And those individuals making home visits have helped to locate and engage many students previously lost. At this time, we really do appreciate and rely on the community connections we have that are so committed to making sure no child goes unserved. Our schools leverage their staff, those who are already working with attendance and those who needed alternative work assignments while students are on a virtual platform. They're making wake up calls for children, checking in with students daily and weekly, calling to check that students are taking their medications, School counselors are conducting individual and small group sessions with students to address mental health and social emotional learning needs. Hungry children struggle to attend and focus. Food services is providing meals on the go. Our community services board has streamlined referrals for services and case management, 
Plus, we've created a comprehensive list of community agencies and resources to provide to families to give them options. Schools have created clothing closets and they collect donations from staff and the community as needs are identified. The school social work department continues to process McKinney-Vento applications to provide support with housing, school placement, tutoring, cards for laundry, and food services. We've also moved to an online enrollment process and form so that we can reduce delays for enrolling children who move to our area. I want to recognize um, I, I want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak today, but I really am only speaking on behalf of a truly collective effort. Um, I have to recognize this work is, is comprehensive among all of the departments, all of our schools, and our community. Without the support of our division leadership team, our school teachers, our school leaders, support staff, Hampton Police Division, and our community partners, we wouldn't be able to achieve equity for many of our children. Now, the more than ever, we need systems to ensure that we're reaching every child and no child falls through the cracks. Please contact our student services team anytime. We're happy to share any of the resources that I've talked about today. Um, we're happy to problem solve or gain ideas from you. It has to be a collective partnership to ensure um, that we are increasing equity for all of the children throughout the Commonwealth. Thank you and I hope you have a great morning of learning. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Really appreciate sharing so much information <clears throat> about what your division's doing. Up next um, are Heather Terman and Erica Schmale. Heather Terman has worked as the McKinney Vento and Foster Care Liaison since 2018. Before that, she worked as a mental health professional in a community setting with adults with severe and chronic mental illness and as a special education teacher in Fairfax and Roanoke counties. Educational credentials include undergraduate degrees in sociology and special education from James Madison University and a master's degree in community counseling from Radford. Erica Schmale manages Richmond Public School Center for Families in Transition, supporting Richmond Public School students and families experiencing housing instability and homelessness. She believes that stable housing improves educational outcomes. She formerly serves, served as the adjunct instructor for VCU School of Social Work and the Regional Coalition Manager for Greater Richmond's Homeless Services Planning Body. Here, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Heather. Thank you, Quinn. So in this section of the webinar, we're going to focus on McKinney-Vento liaisons and how they are your school division's secret weapon when it comes to engagement and attendance. Uh, my name, as Quinn said, is Heather Terman. I am the McKinney-Vento and foster care liaison for Montgomery County Public Schools. Whoop. There we go. Um, here's a a uh, brief summary of what our district profile looks like. We are a, a geographically large um, school division, so it's about 389 square miles, but it's rural. We have just under 10,000 students in 20 schools. Um, we opened our year as a hybrid model, hybrid learning model, so our students go to school four half days a week in person if they choose. Um, we did have two weeks where we had to shut down due to case rising, um, but our K through pre-K through three still did go in the hybrid model. Um, all along, we've had a fully remote option as well as a virtual school option. Um, and so you have the opportunity to participate in your homeschool or a virtual Virginia program. Um, overall, our attendance approach is multi-tiered systems of support. Um, and so that can give you some context for what I talk about next. Um, I wanted to just start by reminding everyone what McKinney-Vento liaisons do. So formally, we identify students experiencing homelessness and ensure that they have the protections they're entitled to under the law. And this includes immediate enrollment, uh, free lunch, transportation assistance if it's in their best interest, and access to community resources. Um, but if you're to think about this informally, we are connecting with our families in transition um, and we're building these relationships. And as we know, relationships lead to better attendance. Um, and I would argue that these McKinney-Vento families and students are our 
most at risk population. They lack consistency in every realm of their life. They are under enormous stressors um, just to meet basic needs. And so often school is not their priority. Um, just to give you a little picture about what our data looks like in Montgomery County, uh, most of our families are doubled up. That means they are living um, with a family member, a relative, um, it could just be a casual acquaintance when they lost their housing. And so these quarters are cramped. Often there's no personal space. And when we're talking about virtual learning, this can be very challenging. Um, and as you see, the rest of our um, population mostly lives in hotels and then we do not really have shelters in our area. Um, so we have about four and a half percent of our population in shelters, scatter site shelters. Um, our school division as a whole has a chronic absenteeism rate of about 12 percent. Um, it's better this year, <laughs> but because um, we're putting in some new things. But if you look at our McKinney-Vento students, it's about double uh, the chronic absenteeism rate of our housed population. So my hope for today um, is that you learn what a McKinney-Vento liaison can offer and then go back to your attendance teams and make sure that you're inviting that liaison to the table. Um, what this looks like in Montgomery County is that I share my student list with our Dean of Students, who's also our truancy officer. And I also come to our interventionist meetings. And so our student assistant program um, has family interventionists or tiered interventionists in all of our schools and they meet weekly. Um, and this is a chance for me to hear what students are in our SAP process, um, what schools are doing as far as interventions go, surrounding attendance, grades, discipline, all of that. Um, and then I'm able to identify where McKinney-Vento students overlap that population and provide additional support to our intervention specialists in the school. Um, and this, you know, having two people work on a problem can often really make a difference. So I'm happy to help. And my, those intervention specialists, they have my list of students experiencing homelessness, but I find that there's a, a real difference about physically coming to the meeting or virtually coming to the meeting um, rather than just having the list because lists get lost, they get forgotten. Um, but when we are problem solving around these high barrier kids, then um, and in person chatting about this, we really can find creative solutions to address their needs. Um, it also helps me stay in the loop as far as what um, participants, or excuse me, stay in the loop as far as what schools are doing and if there's any practices that um, are adversely affecting my McKinney-Vento students or any of our high barrier students, and then I can be an advocate. Um, and, and this is imperative to connected work. So, oh, let me go to the next stream. So what you can expect if you invite me to your table, <laughs> is that here's what I know. I know demographic information about families. Um, McKinney-Vento students are often changing their address. Phone numbers are changing. Sometimes um, they're not working and they can't accept calls. So, you know, we have to figure out other ways. Um, and if we're doing home visits, we wanna make sure we have the right address and I can help make sure that we have that correct information before putting in our extra effort. Um, I also know the family's story. So I know what's contributing, generally, I know what's contributing to their inability to log on, their lack of attendance, um, or the difficulty of getting that student to school. So I can bring that information to the table. I also know their support teams. Um, by the time someone is in housing crisis, they usually do have a support team, whether that's Department of Social Services and case managers or counselors through local community service boards or even staff in schools. Um, I know those teams and we can connect to make sure we have the most relevant and helpful information to really um, plan for that student individually. And this is not information that is shared in a file or an email, it's protected under FERPA. So having your McKinney-Vento liaison at the table will give you that extra bit of information to make good decisions moving forward. Um, I also find that in a rural community, it's helpful because I know the like interpersonal relationships of our families. 
Um, and in this virtual model and this time of pandemic, when people are less connected to schools, when we're going out and trying to do home visits, it's helpful if we can figure out maybe where they're staying or who they know. So those um, relationships within a rural community are helpful to kind of go through when trying to contact our families. And so how I can help. Everyone loves to hear this. I can save you time. <laughs> Your liaison can save you time. Um, our staff is stretched completely thin during this time of pandemic. So rather than having a counselor or an administrator track down that information, your McKinney Vento Liaison can help you get that quickly. Um, we also, I also can get in touch with families. Um, I have countless phone calls of people saying, I've called this family five times. I left messages. They won't get it back in touch with me. And then within the first phone call, I, I can talk to the family and, you know, I have the benefit of providing resources, and so often families do want to talk to me, but if I'm connected to the school team, I can also get that information that the school is trying to communicate. I can get that to the family as well, and we can work together. Um, I can help with community outreach and resources. These families are struggling to meet their basic needs, so um, I've, I've got I serve on boards of shelters, of our scatter site shelter. Um, I serve on our housing partnership, which is our continuum of care group. Um, and so I have housing lists. I know who's providing what within the community. Um, I know who they can talk to about rental relief and child care. Um, all those factors that come in when they're trying to get a schedule and a routine to send their school age child to school. Um, if those other things are not in line, it's harder to get them to um, prioritize the attendance of their student. Um, and then I can also help with transportation. Uh, that's transportation is one of the uh, protections under the McKinney Vento law when it's in the best interest of the student to have specialized transportation to get to their school of origin um, or participate in learning through their school of origin. Um, and I know some people are virtual, lots of people are virtual, but anybody who's in a hybrid model can still benefit from this. Um, so the way that our county does this is we have specialized cars we, I think we have about two cars right now that are functioning to help McKinney Vento students get from place to place. But I also can do fuel cards. Um, we do creative bus routes and um, occasionally I use taxis because of the distance that we have to cover. Um, sometimes one or two cars isn't going to cut it. Um, and I have countless examples of students coming up in our family partnership meetings and the stu the school being at their wits end with not being able to um, get a handle on the student attendance. Um, and then it comes up in those meetings that they, the family is experiencing homelessness. And once they come to me, I'm able to implement that transportation and then the attendance immediately changes. So sometimes it's just a matter of families not knowing that they have the right to ask for this um, or feeling comfortable enough to ask for that. Um, I always remember personal stories when thinking about what's going on. Um, and I have a, I, this one sticks out the most to me is it was a, a kindergarten family and they were dropping their kid off late every single day, picking up early every single day. The school tried their hardest to try to tell them this isn't how we do it. He's losing out on instructional time. And the family just started pulling back and back and back. Um, and so the school felt like they were being lied to. And at that point, frustrations grew. Um, mistrust happened through both parties, as we all do when we feel like we're not being told the truth. Um, and eventually it came to my attention and I was able to get down to the root of the problem. Um, and they were homeless. They had lost their housing. They were doubled up. They were now in a different school division. Mom was terrified that she wouldn't be able to send her kid to that same school. So they were piecemealing it and making it work. Um, they also had a farm use truck. So and we have SROs, student, our school resource officers, at our schools for drop off and pick up. And they were terrified that he was going to get a ticket and have his car taken away. This was the only way that he could get to work. So you can see why they were trying to miss the time that the school resource officer was there. And then finally, because of the homelessness, the mom was terrified that she was going to lose her child. She had no idea that 
homelessness in and of it of, of itself is not a reason for CPS involvement. Um, and so once we were able to build that trust and I shared that re, that information with her, um, we were able to get him to school consistently and he had a great rest of the of the year. Um, they actually ended up finding housing and jobs um, and I haven't heard from them again, which is always good news. Um, another way I can help is data analysis. So all schools collect data, but having someone who deals with this high barrier population bring that lens of analysis, I can help look for patterns that are gonna positively impact our, our instructional planning, but also our attendance policies. Um, also additional information, just providing additional information. If you are not someone who works with homeless students on a regular basis or knows the McKinney-Vento law back and forth, um, or even the foster care system doesn't know all of the ins and outs of the foster care system, there might be different pieces that positively can impact students that you don't know about. So talk to that person who is the expert. Uh, we had an example this year, we had a lot of our foster students were um, were participating remotely when they had the option to come in person and their grades were suffering because of it and attendance was suffering because of it. So I was able to connect the schools with the right team, know who the decision makers were in order to decide whether the best interest was for them to be virtual or in person. Um, and those students were able to get into the school building, but it's just a matter of knowing who to talk to and who to connect to. And I was able to do that quickly for the staff. Um, and then <laughs> finally, creative problem solving. I feel like as um, school personnel, we are all wonderful at creative problem solving, especially in this time of pandemic. Um, but as a McKinney-Vento liaison, I do this every day. I have to figure out ways to meet my students and families' needs. Um, and I often think that if it's written into my McKinney-Vento law that we have this flexibility and this, this way to kind of um, meet the students' needs where they're at. Why can't we do this for all of our high barrier students? Um, and I know there's reasons and rules that are above my pay grade, um, but I, I, I think about this often as the last presenter was saying, the idea of equality is not always equitable. So, and that applies to my bikini vento students, but also our chronically absent students. So having that ability to creatively problem solve is imperative. So in closing, I hope that I've made it clear um, how beneficial a McKinney-Vento liaison can be when it comes to problem solving around the students, especially those that need extra support to attend school. Um, so just remember, your McKinney-Vento liaison can help you contact, advocate, and connect and support with not only students, but families, and we can also do that for staff. So um, I encourage you to connect with that liaison at your school and make sure that they're part of your planning team. Here's my contact information if you need it. Um, and thank you for allowing me to um, root for liaisons to be part of the team. <laughs>
um, in a little over 40 schools. Um, we will be remaining virtual until February 2021 um, and um, you know, possibly further. We'll be looking at that, the school board will be looking at that shortly. So um, a little bit about the city of Richmond. We are a community that is uh, 62 square miles. Typically when people think about the city of Richmond, they think of, of it in quadrants. They think of uh, north side, south side, east end, and west end. Um, and that's really important in the work that we're doing because each of these areas are really unique in, the, in its character and the demographics um, within the different regions of our city. Um, and we know that attendance is a community-wide issue, attendance is an engagement issue. And so we need to be addressing attendance um, through various community stakeholders alongside RPS staff. Um, so this year we are using a community hub model. So that's designed to serve families where they are um, and based on their needs. So we actually have uh, four community hubs um, across the city of Richmond. Um, so we are in the neighborhoods of which students and families live. Um, and we also have needs-based centers like the Center for Families in Transition that I work at, um, as well as like our welcome center that supports newcomer families. Just a little bit of a division-wide look before I funnel down into the um, specific work that the Center for Families in Transition does. But as you can see, RPS has dedicated um, significant staffing resources to our engagement and attendance efforts because we believe that um, engagement is an academic strategy. So this means that we have a coordinator and we have family liaisons within every region of the city. Um, and those family liaisons are working very collaboratively with the school social workers in each school and the school attendance teams in each school. So we are very much doing a team approach to um, attendance and to engagement. Some of the pieces that are happening on a um, division-wide level of work that we are doing um, now that we are virtual is that we have a division-wide family support line. So we have a number that staff and families can call to um, get questions answered around technology issues, around when meals are being provided, um, and additional questions like that. Um, we're also trying to share information in as many different ways as possible. So we are doing um, short posted videos. Uh, we're doing live virtual trainings. We have community pop-ups in neighborhoods where we have a team of family liaisons and school staff going into neighborhoods um, to share information. Um, during the community pop-ups, we're also doing canvassing, so door-to-door -door information sharing of resources, um, school information, and then also helping problem solve issues. Um, we're also looking at obviously our uh, tiered approach is that um, you know that uh, Hampton and other school systems were talking about earlier is really thinking about when we're seeing a student not coming to school, doing checkup calls, finding out what the issues are. So a lot of times the issues are around attendant, you know, around internet issues. Um, families are really stressed, so helping them problem solve barriers that may exist around getting you know getting online to class. Um, helping families set up a conducive learning environment at home um, and connecting families to resources. So doing those checking calls, helping families through this stressful time. Um, also, if we're not, if, you know, if we haven't seen a student in, um, come into the classroom, doing porch visits, actually doing home visits, going out, seeing, seeing families, um, continuing our collaborative approach around school-based attendance teams, um, and having the, the neighborhood expert, who is the family liaison, at the table on those teams as well. Um, and another piece that we're looking at as the division is having a part, we have a partnership database so that we can easily um, bring in volunteers, bring in nonprofits, bring in businesses to support the work that we're doing. Um, and through some of my specific examples, I will um, talk a little bit about that. So, Myself and my team, um, we have conversations every day with families who have lost housing due to evictions, fires, domestic violence, and they're now staying somewhere temporarily. 
Um, most of the families that we serve are currently, they're staying in a spare bedroom or in the living room of a friend or family member's home. Um, uh, you know, the next largest group of folks are um, squeezing into one small hotel room together. And then we also do have some families that are sleeping in um, shelters, area shelters, or staying in their cars. Um, in the 18-19 school year, we served, um, it was, we served 20, um, sorry, we served almost 1,200 students experiencing homelessness um, in rich public schools. Um, and it's important to recognize that this issue of housing instability and homelessness is not going away, right? Um, within the city of Richmond, we have the second highest eviction rate for the uh, country. Uh, and that uh, eviction rate, high eviction rate does exist across Virginia as well. We also see that affordable housing in Richmond and across Virginia um, doesn't exist, right? It exists, but not to the extent needed for families um, to, um, access that resource. Um, and we now have a pandemic, we have um, families losing jobs, um, we have a lot of economic hardship happening. So we will continue to see issues with housing instability and homelessness uh, moving forward. And um, as Heather mentioned, that, that can be a big issue because in Richmond, we are um, chronic um, absenteeism numbers really do mirror what um, what they are seeing in Montgomery as well. So we also see that about that students experiencing homelessness are twice as likely to be chronically absent than their uh, peers. So that's where the Center for Families in Transition come in. So the Center Richmond Public Schools Center for Families in Transition that is myself and a team of. Um, three other staff members. We are population need specific, focused on students and families experiencing homelessness. Um, our biggest goal is making sure that students can enroll, attend, and succeed in school. Um, and we do that through connecting students to school-based and community-based resources. Um, and we really try to partner with the school, the community, and the family in the work that we are doing. I now want to dig into some really give you some really um, deep dive into four initiatives that we're doing in our area. And I hope by being really specific, um, you can take something universal from the information that I'm providing. So the first piece that I want to talk about is um, we know that homelessness has a really negative impact on um, students and families and on academic achievement. Um, so one thing to be aware of is that we really want to stop homelessness before it happens. We really want to prevent that um, housing loss. And by preventing that housing loss, we are, um, we are possibly preventing future attendance issues. Um, there's actually a lot of eviction prevention resources around the state right now. So it is a really good time to help families be able to remain in their home. So I did include some on the screen to be aware of. I would encourage um, folks to look up um, the Virginia Poverty Law Center. They have a wonderful housing resources. There's also an eviction legal helpline. Um, that number is on that screen. It's 833-NO-EVICT. Um, and um, that is a statewide number. And there's also statewide rent and mortgage relief happening across the state. So I do want to just emphasize that. But specifically in the city of Richmond, we are partnering with a local nonprofit um, that to refer families for rental assistance. So we're able to actually complete the intake packet for the family. Um, so that the family can more quickly and easily connect to that resource rather than them calling us and then us sending them to that person, them, you know, that agency, then having to wait, we're able to talk to that family and automatically do the intake information, let the family know what other resources they need to gather um, in order to um, get connected. Um, so an example of that is we had uh, Miss S, her and her, her and her elementary school child, had contacted the family support line that I mentioned, that division wide line that we're doing. Um, she mentioned that she's experiencing uh, food insecurity and that uh, they're behind on rent. Um, so the support line referred the family over to our office. We were able to give that family a call, have a conversation, find out that yes, she is behind on rent, 
He lost hours on work due to the pandemic. Um, and so we were able to go through that intake on the phone right then, um, tell her the additional information that she needed, get permission from her to send that over to the agency. We sent the information over to that agency and, um, and they were able to uh, write her a check for all of her back rent. Um, and so that meant that that child now is going to be able to remain in, in their home rather than having to move. And we also, through that conversation, were able to connect a family to our grocery delivery program. So I want to share a little bit about our grocery delivery program. So um, when the schools closed last spring, um, obviously we, like all school divisions, started thinking about what are the biggest student needs right now? Um, and one need that came up was food access. So we applied for a grant with our local community foundation as well as No Kid Hungry program. Um, and we put out a call to community members saying we need support with food delivery. So starting in April, 2020, uh, RPS delivers um, weekly groceries to about 150 families a week. That's about 300 students. Um, we utilize 21 volunteers every week. They receive a route um, Thursday morning and they go out and they deliver to that route. Um, during that delivery, it's also a great opportunity to share flyers with school information about things going on, as well as hygiene, educational items, school supplies, those types of things along um, with, our, with our grocery support. Um, so an example of that that happened um, with our grocery program is we were working with a family, Miss M. Um, her family was moving around frequently. And because of this, her students were missing a lot of time. They weren't logging in virtually, right? Um, thankfully, um, the school reached out to us and we had been delivering groceries to that family. Uh, and so we actually have an updated address, right? Because we're texting the families every week, letting them know their groceries are coming. They're letting us know where they're staying. So we have an updated address, updated phone number. Um, we were able to jump into that attendance team meeting um, and have a conversation about their updated information, as well as problem solve some other ways to support that family. Um, so through, uh, through the grocery delivery, it's a really great way of delivering items um, to families. Uh, and it allows us to get updated, you know, keep updated information for families as well. Um, on top of the grocery delivery, we also do a separate delivery of basic needs items. So we collect, um, we use just a Google survey with families and ask about things that they may need. We have um, a resource room and a clothing closet as a part of our center. And so we are able to pool uh, clothing school supplies, hygiene items, basic home items uh, for families um, and deliver those as well to families. Again, um, great way to keep in touch with families and get families items that they need. Um, if this is something that your school division is interested in and you're like, I don't have access to those grants, if you are looking specifically to support students experiencing homelessness, um, consider contacting your Title I office um, and looking into the um, homeless uh, set aside through Title I. Another program that is my, um, something that I'm super excited that Richmond Public Schools is working on is, I mentioned that housing resources are limited within Richmond and across Virginia. So for families who are temporarily staying in um, family members' homes or in a hotel, there's actually not focused housing support for those families. You would think that because they are experiencing homelessness that the community would be able to wrap around them and support them, but there's actually not resources that exist. So what that means is that um, if a family you know, is, you know, is temporarily staying in a hotel, right? They're paying for that hotel and then they're looking for housing. Um, they're putting in application fees, but they may have um, past eviction, they may have some other barriers that are causing them not to get access to that housing, right? They're, they're just not getting accepted into housing. Um, if they finally do find a place that accepts them, they then have to come up with three times the rent. So let's say that your rent is, you know, $500, very, very affordable rent, right? Um, you would have to come up with $1,500 for the first month's rent and double security deposit. So that's that's huge barrier to moving into uh, moving into housing, which means that you, your family stays um, 
stays doubled up or stays in a hotel and stays moving around, um, impacting students, um, you know, academics. So we were really thinking about this. It was a big issue for us. Um, and so we ended up partnering with a local agency, Housing Families First. Uh, together, we applied for a $500,000 grant um, through another local foundation. And um, we received the grant, which is super excited. And we've actually, through receiving our initial funds, we've been approached for a lot of additional opportunities for support, which is wonderful. Um, what that program looks like is that um, RPS staff now, we have added housing into our conversations with families. And so with every family that's experiencing homelessness, we have a conversation about housing with them. We, we do a pre-screening for this, um, this program that with Housing Families First, and um, we, we find out some information about them, if this is something they would be interested in. We then support families with um, collecting the documents that you need to move in, so like ID, or certificates, those types of things. And um, once a family has their documents, we prioritize a family, you know, we, we, we prioritize families based on their need to get connected to that housing. And one of the needs that we look at is attendance, right? If we're really wanting to approach um, housing uh, as an academic strategy, then making sure that we can connect students that have had poor attendance to housing um, with the hopes to improve their um, attendance moving forward. So, um, so we prioritize families based on need. Um, and we connect uh, a family to that resource. What's really awesome is right now we're able, we're connecting about three families a week to Housing Families First, um, which means that we're able to support a lot of families with moving into their own homes. Um, and the great thing about having a family connected, having this housing program connected to a school system is that, you know, we're able to have, we have weekly case conferencing with the other agency, um, and then once we hear the family's about to be leased, we're able to follow back up with that family, see what additional items they need for their home. And we're able to then follow that family for the remainder of time that the child is in our school division, uh, meaning that the, you know, the child's getting additional supports that maybe they normally wouldn't in a regular housing program. Uh, so an example of what this looks like, we were working with a family, Miss A. She has three children. You see her beautiful Miss A is on the screen, actually. Um, her three children, they had moved at least over five times last school year due to homelessness. Um, her children were missing a lot of school. They were chronically absent. Miss um, A actually contacted me over the summer and she let me know that she had found housing for her children, um, but she needed support with moving costs. Uh, and so I was able to quickly connect her with Housing Families First because she because um, she had already done the legwork on the housing. So I was able to connect her with that, pay those moving costs. And so now Miss uh, Miss A is um, and her children are in their own housing. Uh, her children are able to actually learn virtually, sitting at their you know at a desk, their own desk um, this school year, and we're still able to support them with the grocery deliveries. Um, and other resources now that they're in their home. So um, it's very, very exciting that we have some of those housing resources with the uh, The final piece that I wanna share with you is that we just do, we also, although we're doing a lot of supports with families, we also do some work with um, young people. So we know that there are high school students that are um, living on their own, so unaccompanied youth. Um, and we have a staff member that's dedicated to supporting high school students. Um, so she uh, connects with all of our high school students, does educational co case comfort, I mean, case management. Uh, and a part of that is reviewing attendance, collaborating with school staff. Um, you know, we include notes, um, you know, based on the work that she's doing in our student database. So that way school social workers and things can collaborate in that work. Um, a great reason that this is so helpful is that um, just um, last month we were working with a student, uh, a family, and we realized that through looking at data, we realized that one of the child, one child was in school, but the family actually had another child that was not put on our radar who was out of school, right, and hadn't enrolled, hadn't attended school yet this school year. 
Um, so we already having a relationship, already uh, the staff member, Lakeisha, who works with students, already had a relationship with this family. So was able to, um, you know, quickly connect with mom, figure out what's the issue, why is this other child not in school yet, um, other high schooler, and uh, put the student back in school and she is now attending. So it's through having those personal connections with families and working directly with high school students and following them. Um, that we're really able to, uh, you know, improve attendance. So that's some of the pieces that we are doing within Richmond Public Schools to support students and families experiencing homelessness. Here is my contact information. I really appreciate being able to talk to you all about this today. Um, and if you have any questions, I'll check the chat um, and respond to folks in there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Heather Terman and Erica Schmally. We really appreciate all the information and the secret weapon that uh, ho homeless liaisons can really be for our school teams. Uh, up next are Greg Hopkins and Ed Holmes. Greg is the Juvenile Justice Program Coordinator for the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services. And in that role, Greg serves as the state's Juvenile Justice Specialist and the Racial and Ethnic Disparities Coordinator. Greg has over 20 years of juvenile justice experience working and serving youth and families. He started his career in juvenile corrections, has worked in juvenile probation, administered juvenile drug treatment program, and served as a local juvenile community programs manager. Greg is committed to creating the best opportunities for youth through statewide outreach, creating local opportunities for change, and modeling best practices. Ed Holmes is responsible for technical assistance, grant monitoring, and management of programs funded by OJJDP, Title II, Title V, and JABG programs, and other uh, grant-funded programs. Ed retired after 35 years from the Virginia Department of Juvenile Justice, and he has worked in a variety of professional positions in juvenile justice, including Eastern Regional Administrator, DJJ Field Operations Manager, and Regional Programs Manager. He received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology from Hampton University and an MSW from the Norfolk State University Graduate School of Social Work. And thank you so much. I'll turn this over to Greg. Thank you, Quinn. Um, first of all, I want to give a shout out to Montgomery County, Hampton City, Norfolk, and Richmond. A special shout out to Richmond. I'm a Richmond Public School graduate. Um, there's a lot of good work going on across the state. And we wanna make sure that we give ourselves the opportunity to give ourselves a hand of, a round of applause because everyone's doing a great job. Um, we're gonna to talk to you guys about diversion practices, but before we get into it, um, we are the last portion of today's webinar, uh, but I wanna give you all an understanding of what DCJS and give you a provider or the overview of our agency. Um, but before I get started on it, this, what, what our presentation is gonna focus on root causes of sort of truancy. What are some of the diversion practices currently going on around the state? Example and definition of diversion practices. Um, an example of some of our Title II funded programs across the state and more importantly, the consequences of court involvement for our youth that are sometimes before the court under status offenses, which is those chins in need of child in need of supervision or services, those chins petitions. Uh, before we get started, I want to provide you with some additional information about our HC DCJS. We are responsible for pretty much all things law enforcement as it relates to funding, federal funding and state funding. Um, a small portion of that is monitoring and ensuring that Virginia complies with the Federal Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act. And, that's, and they have four core requirements of that act that we must comply with in order to receive our Title II funding. That Title II funding is pretty much dispersed throughout our localities. So you guys can continue to do the great work that you guys are doing now. Um, and those four core requirements are sight sound separation. We ensure and monitor all juvenile lockups, jails and detention centers to make sure our juveniles in these holding facilities are not exposed or have any time contact with adult offenders. We also remove youth from adult jails and lockups and making sure that those kids that are not certified are not in those jail lockups. We have two compliance monitors that pretty much carry out those activities and duties throughout um, the year. Um, we have 24 detention homes, one juvenile correctional centers, all uh, it's a host of jails and prisons that's uh, housed juvenile um, and incarcerate juveniles. We have holding facilities in Dulles Airport that we have to monitor. Um, 
Third one is reduce and eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in our juvenile justice system. We look at those key decision points where we see the overrepresentation of black and brown kids. And we see that oftentimes, not just in Virginia, but across the country, where certain kids of color are overrepresented in the intake phase, um, the adjudication phase, um, it could be arraignment. And we try ways and work with localities to mitigate that. But lastly, one of the things in the topic of discussion today is the deinstitutionalization of status offenders. Those status offenders are those kids that go before the court um, for curfew violation, truancy uh, petitions. We often see that manifest in a CHINS petition, Child in Need of Supervision or Services. So let's dive into this real quick um, with our diversion practice. Let me know if you guys can see if I'm pretty much advancing the slides. I want to make sure you guys can follow me as I do this at home. Let's see, can you see that one? Okay, thank you. So what is diversion practices? Mm -hmm. Diversion is a term used to describe intervention approaches that redirect youth away from formal processing in the juvenile justice system. While still holding them accountable for their actions, the goal of diversion is to remove youth as early in the juvenile justice process as possible to avoid later negative outcomes associated with formal processing. Um, there are many strategies what we've seen over the years and sometimes often manifest within our juvenile court system, but also in our communities as well, such as diversion opportunities in our local law enforcement, um, or diversion opportunities within our school settings, and sometimes within our own communities, and it could manifest within our CSBs, a simple warning and release program. Uh, sometimes it could be check-ins, even in day reporting centers. Um, because programs are usually designed to fit the need of the community, there is a wide variation of diversion programming uh, and research that supports it. One of the things that we want to make sure is that we be effective on the front end when we work with youth. Um, there's a lot of conversations in the beginning about how can we best, you know, address some of the issues before they manifest. Um, our goal is to make sure these kids don't increase their trajectory in the juvenile justice system, especially if they pose no risk to public safety. Um, let's see. Diversion also is based on a belief that formal system processing and incarceration of youth leads to greater likelihood of their future criminal behavior and that alternatives such as decriminalization, deinstitutionalization, and diversion are better for long term um, for youth development. Uh, by creating informal channels and navigate youth, specifically those status offenses, Away from traditional processing, diversion programs serve the opportunity to correct youth antisocial behavior with the assistance of their family, community, rather than through the justice system. Sometimes our kids, we go through what you call a first stage of contact, which is in that school office, and that parent has to take off from work. That parent has to find a babysitter for the siblings. Um, there is other, other issues that we don't necessarily, as human service providers, know that present themselves for families. And they get to our office and these SAT teams, they unpack, um, they start telling us about, you know, the daddy, the cousin, the family living arrangements, the work employment, social security numbers, addresses, um, last school attendance, attended. And then from that point on, they go meet with the intake officers and repeat the same conversation. And before you know it, they have unpacked four times prior to kids getting services. It can actually be an extra burden and traumatizing experience, not just for the youth, but for the parent. Um, because one, is she's taking time off from work. Um, there needs to be some sort of living arrangements that be made or uh, arrangement made for siblings. If not, they have to come to the office with them. So juvenile diversion is there to really mitigate and pretty much uh, address some of those issues that we can see can be handled on the front end. As you can see, and those who work with juvenile courts, um, Department of Juvenile Justice have intake offices inside their court service unit directly in there to really try to impose diversion services, case management services, before we start moving that kid throughout the juvenile justice process. So what are some of the root causes of truancy? Um, Tiffany sort of, she's, she shared that information in her presentation of what they're doing in Hampton. I like to use this. We used it several times when we um, present in front of the judges, uh, SROs, um, and some of the school board members. What are those complex root causes of truancy? Um, there's four areas that we often see, and that's sometimes family specific. It could be a lack of guidance and supervision, domestic violence within the home, lack of knowledge of truancy, uh, 
parental substance abuse. Uh, when we talk about what goes on in the community, a lot of our kids, uh, specifically, and we look at some of the urban areas that could be some high criminal activity, um, gang activity, inadequate transportation sometimes impact our kids getting to school on time. Um, and then there's that peer influence that we see. Um, a lot of young kids hang out with the older kids that sort of mirror some of the behaviors that they uh, they assume sometimes is, is healthy. Um, when we talk about student-specific services, it could be poor level of self-esteem, um, lack of positive peer relationship. Um, and then it's, you know, we go to the school specific, that's the school climate. Are we really making an inviting um, opportunity for our kids to learn in our communities, and especially within our school? Um, schools have a big, and I say it's a, a a major task in addressing a lot of issues from different youth that come before them each day um, from different backgrounds. And it's it's a very challenging process. And um, But we also have to keep our caps on when our lens is on when it comes to dealing youth with certain challenges that uh, present themselves each day when they come into the school setting. So our job here at DCGS, we provide Title II funds for localities across the Commonwealth of Virginia. And for all the, for us to get that money, as I mentioned before, we have to make sure Virginia is in compliance uh, with those four core requirements. We provide Title II funds. I'm sorry, Ed, you go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, you know, diversion is really a, a, an important function because usually, once the kid enters the juvenile justice system, we tend not to want to let them go. And so we set, set up rules and regulations for families and for children. And, you know, typical behavior of a teenager can be construed as criminal if you're under court supervision. Just think about the number of times when you were growing up when you didn't return home at your curfew hour. <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. but for a kid under court supervision, that becomes a supervision violation. And Absolutely. those kind of behaviors and, and uh, restrictions and violations push kids deeper uh, into our system. And I also recognize that usually if a kid is truant or acting out, more than likely he's acting out something that's going on in the home or in the family. It could be homelessness, could be substance abuse. Um, so we have to be careful because once we identify kids as a problem, we lose track of the family dynamics that contribute to um, those kids' behaviors. So we funded some programs, a lot of programs across the state. Um, we funded Chesterfield County for restorative justice practices. That's essentially a training program uh, training coaches and staff to use restorative practices, restorative conferencing as a way to have an alternative to, you know, more severe discipline. And we've been funding that program for several years. Chesterfield is a rather large school district, a lot, a lot of turnover. So we've made a commitment to um, support the training of their teachers um, in restorative practices. Now, I went to one of their um, training exercises and I have to admit that I think I sold teachers short <laughs> when I realized that they were not only teaching, managing classrooms, and now we're asking them to do restorative practices. I start to realize that how short a school day is and how little time teachers have. So I am a big champion of teachers after that training session. I think we those of us in juvenile justice um, don't really recognize the, the um, amount of time and effort that teachers spend uh, with kids in the classroom. We have an, another program in, in, in Kilmarnock. It's a, a partnership between the Boys and Girls Club of the Northern Neck. If you know anything about the Northern Neck, it's a very rural area. And so they provide transportation for kids in that school system to come to the Boys Club and they do career readiness training as well as financial literacy training, um, trying to complement what happens in school and making it more practical uh, for kids so that they can uh, make a good adjustment in school. Now, I will say all these programs I'm talking about were going along at a real nice pace until COVID hit. 
and we, we found ourselves, um, well, our agency went home in March. And then our, our grantees, uh, we had to figure out a way to kind of ease their anxiety because funding streams are time limited. So we contacted our grantees and offered them uh, extensions, budget amendments. You know, if you're, if you're seeing kids face to face, do you need to buy tablets or other equipment to stay in contact virtually? But COVID kind of shut things down for most of our programs um, in March. We also have funded some programs in, in Richmond, peer justice program, Nuka News, uh, brought in a specialist from out of state to talk about truancy, to build truancy policy for the school district. And we're trying to get Winchester uh, up and running to do a, a you know, after school weekend program for those kids who are not doing well in school. It's more of a one-stop shop, you know, uh, counseling, tutoring, trying to keep status offenders from being uh, brought before the court and pushed deeper into the system. You know, next slide, Greg. Mm -hmm. So Danville Community Services Board, um, partnered with Danville Public Schools to um, conduct two evidence-based programs. And that's one of the things that we ask folks to do is to find an evidence-based program that works um, and partner you know, with an agency or a freestanding entity to do evidence-based programming. Of course, the goal for um, the folks in Denver is to reduce the number of uh, long-term suspensions in middle and high school. And so they um, picked up two evidence-based programs One's called, one's called Project Towards No Abuse, and the other's called Investors, Victims, and Bystanders, Thinking for Change, Thinking Active to Prevent Violence. Once COVID hit, um, in March, Danville kind of shut down. And so we asked Danville to, you know, consider training their staff, consider an alternative ways of contacting youth. And September and March. Once March hit, a lot of places just couldn't function. And so that was one of the, the, the downfalls of the Danville. But what they did, they did some follow-up with kids in the juvenile court and some training with their staff to prepare for next year. No one knew in March that we will still be experiencing the fallout from COVID now in December. So it was just an unknown quantity. Next slide, Greg, okay. So Western Taiwan Community Services Board um, has an uplift after school program, teach life skills to kids, address risk factors. It's the after school program from three to seven that provide transportation. One of the beauty of the community services board that they have well-trained staff who can do prevention intervention as well as clinical approaches. And so a lot of the kids who come to the Suffolk program have benefit of clinical services on site provided by the community services. Um, they've had success with these kids. They haven't had any additional judicial contact and the kids that were in the program had not been suspended. However, COVID had an impact on their face-to-face -face opportunities. So they ended up with a telehealth, telehealth platform and uh, had hourly meetings with each kid during the week. Of course, that didn't suffice for face-to-face, -face, but it really gave them opportunity to stay engaged with the children uh, as well as um, you know, providing, you know, parents are always involved in these programs and provided parents the opportunity to um, approach them if they need additional services. City of Warrington uh, had a unique pro program. There are some kids, you know, who have issues about sitting still in class, or behavior in class. And again, they picked up a evidence-based program called Project Ease. It allows kids to learn to manage their anxiety and stress in the classroom. 
And um, they had referrals came from the juvenile court and from the schools. The program was delivered on site at the schools in, 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 uh, in Warrington. And it's been very successful. Now, of course, when COVID came, they went to telephone contact and virtual contact. Um, so it's, it's just hard to gauge the impact of COVID. But up until March, they were having great success with these kids who were unable to manage themselves in the classroom. But with uh, evidence-based program, COPE were able to manage and have, um, you know, be by themselves or use other techniques to deal with their anxiety. So community-based programs are, in our opinion, most effective in improving long-term outcomes. They have reduced reoffending. They've increased educational attainment. Behavioral health care is something that's addressed by our, our vendors. Family functioning, we have a, always a demand that there's a big family component with parents. We're always looking for programs that build skills of children and their families to deal with themselves and each other. And we always stress connections to um, support systems in the community. So one of the biggest things that we wanna kind of drill down on is the consequences of court involvement. Uh, myself and Mr. Holmes have worked in the juvenile justice field for quite some time. Uh, many of the kids that we've seen came before us and and they have been there, um, came before us in the capacity of having a chance petition. Uh, within three to six months, that young man, a young woman has now got a new criminal offense and they've sort of set, uh, lowered their anchor in the juvenile justice system. Um, for over two years, I believe, our agency has been working and addressing the issue of status offenses and offenders with some of our stakeholders. Virginia is one of those localities that, that not localities, but states that has a valid court order exception. Um, some states have gone, done away with it. Um, however, Virginia has it. Um, once a probation officer get a case in their office for a chance petition, some originated from school, some originated, uh, be it from a parent, um, but there's pretty much some rules and regulations that a youth must abide by. Go to school every day, go to anger management, go to community service program. I need you to come home at 6 p.m. Uh, when the kid doesn't do what they supposed to do, they go before the judge, because a lot of folks say, if you don't listen to me, I know someone you can listen to. And they go before the court and the judge say, hey, listen, you haven't done what you're supposed to do. Um, we're gonna set a review date in 45 days. I need you young man to go to school every day, be on time. Um, I also need you to respect your parents, but participate in this anger management program, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I need you to complete community service on the weekends. Um, what we fail to realize, that's a lot for a young kid. Um, Cause I don't like getting up sometimes, getting up and go to work. I don't like getting up and washing the car on the weekends, whatever it may be. But we put these burdens in this, 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 uh, heavy lift on these youth, when they come back to court, what happens? They haven't done it, but in Virginia, that judge can get that kid seven days in detention. And that kid is now in the detention for something that if an adult would have done, uh, they would not have been criminalized. Um, and as we talk and go through the next three slides, what you will see is that sometimes we don't give our youth the opportunity to age out of delinquency. And what we sometimes do without putting, if this was my child cap on, um, we perpetuate some of the um, misfortunes when it comes to youth being involved in the juvenile justice system. Is that in some correct, Ed, you think so? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, thinking back to my own childhood years ago, <laughs> <laughs> you know, coming home on time, being where I was supposed to be, um, you know, acting out in school, because I wasn't on supervision, my parents didn't have to worry about a probation officer visit to my home. Right. Um, and I think sometimes we forget, you know, being an adolescent growing up, whether it's in the, in the country or in the city, it's a trying time. 
Uh, you know, I had an experience several years ago. I sat on a child fatality review team for the state for several years. And you know, this review team goes through homicide, suicide of adolescent youth. And of course, we get all the case files for all the youth that say committed suicide in a given year. And what was really um, impressive to me is that so many kids have secret lives that no one knows about. And when you get the case folders of the mental health worker, the social worker, the teacher, family members, you realize that, you know, youth go through a complex experience on a daily basis. And a lot of their time is spent at school. And so many teachers have an opportunity to intervene and a lot of them do intervene. But just recognize that a lot of teams have secret lives that we have no idea about. And so, you know, bringing a kid into a court system um, puts that label of being bad on them. Um, and the thing about juvenile court as opposed to other agencies, the door is wide open. It doesn't take much to get a child into juvenile court to talk to an intake officer. And, you know, by, by laws, intake officer has to deal with any kind of complaint that comes from the public, school official, or law enforcement officer, a neighbor. And uh, that's why diversion is really so important. Because um, chances are kids, now a lot of kids are diverted and never come back. But those kids who aren't diverted usually end up deeper into the, into the system. And uh, it, it's just very unfortunate. We know there are a lot of factors around being detained, being labeled, that really, really has a detrimental effect on, on teens and their families. Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the things that we, we see it oftentimes is that when kids come to the court, they are label bad kids and they figure that stigma with them is going to stay with them forever. Um, so it, it might, I guess for the sake of time, let's go through this real quick. But Oftentimes with kids uh, that pose no significant risk to public safety are exposed to the juvenile system. We sort of put them in a, in a situation where they could be harmed. They can have increased levels of trauma. Uh, they feel like they're in this down themselves um, and they don't want to talk and they become self-isolated um, and they become deeply involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, and as Mr. Holmes said, the importance of diversion is critical at this point because we do not want kids' trajectory to increase. Um, what we want to do is, when we talk about those decision points, create those trap doors, be it at the intake, be it at uh, diversion, probation, arraignment, detention, and uh, maybe commitment. If there's an opportunity for us to be able to exit have a young man and his family exit the system, let's go ahead and make that opportunity happen. But before it goes to the juvenile court, there's a lot of intervention that could be done in the community. And that's where it takes a lot of partnerships. What we heard today from Montgomery, Hampton, Norfolk and Richmond was some of the critical resources uh, available within these communities to really advance some of the conversations, advance some of the work that is being done. Um, but our agency, what we're here to do, like Mr. Holmes said, is provide resources. We provide Title II opportunities pretty much twice a year, sometimes three times a year. And those Title II opportunities come in grant solicitations. Um, what we've noticed over the past seven months that COVID has presented us with some difficult challenges. Um, and as we start our planning for our next Title II opportunity, we want to make sure we guys have the opportunity to actually have a chance to getting some of these resources to help um, help you guys out um, on, a, on the ground level in the, local, in the localities. So if you have an opportunity, go to our website, www.dcgs.virginia.gov and sign, in, sign and subscribe to our uh, mailing list and you will see all the grant opportunities, train opportunities that come out. Um, and here's our contact information, um, Greg Hopkins and Mr. Ed Holmes. At below, this is our email address. Give us a call, a shout, whatever you need, and we can definitely answer some of the questions you may have when it comes to resources and technical assistance yeah, if like needed. 
one more thing, Greg. Mm -hmm. We have we have funded tobacco cessation programs in Carroll County and human trafficking programs in Prince William County. No program, no program or problem is too big or too small for Title II funding. All right, I'm gonna hand it back to you, Queen. Great, thank you so much for such great um, opportunities and funding funding opportunities for pro various programs. I know we're starting to run out of time. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank all of the presenters uh, and Sarah's gonna speak a little bit to um, uh, maybe some of the questions, if we have a little bit of time to answer maybe some key questions and um, share information about how we can move forward. Hi, everyone. Um, so, so much wonderful information shared. I know that several of you were not able to log in immediately to the webinar due to the fact that we reached capacity so quickly. Um, if that is your situation, please rest assured that you will be able to view the entire recording via YouTube. Um, and that will be shared with all those that registered um, the link directly to that, that recording, as well as the uh, PowerPoint slides that were uh, shared today. There were several questions that came through asking for specific links or uh, specific examples from some of our presenters, like the action plan um, and the one pager that Sophia spoke to, we will be asking our, our panelists if they are willing to share those resources. And if so, then we will send those out as well with the slides. So any of the specific resources that, that were uh, requested, we will, we will be sharing those with you. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through all of those questions um, individually. A lot of the questions that were asked were answered by our presenters um, through the Q&A uh, feature. So I, I, I hopefully, a lot of you were able to, to view those answers, but we will also share those answers out um, when we share the resources from today's presentation. Um, it's very difficult for me to pick just one or two questions for us to field while we have all these wonderful experts at our disposal. Uh, I guess one of the ones that I, I feel like echoes a lot of the sentiments that came through is what, it, what are some of the out-of-the-box strategies that you have employed um, when working with attendants and students when all the traditional measures just don't seem to be working, when you've done your home visits, when you've met with the family and met um, their transportation or their internet needs? Uh, is there anything that, that wasn't spoken to today, any, uh, you know, silver bullets that, that really seem to work when... Um, trying to address attendance in these really difficult cases that any of our panelists want to speak to. I will say that one in addressing this, one of the things that was brought up uh, initially was talking about root cause analysis. And when you have situations like this, where you have done all of the traditional interventions and supports uh, to address an attendance issue with a student, it, it's really comes down to continuing to dig and figuring out what is, is driving the issue, what, um, what's underneath. And, and there's, you know, there's no one answer for this. Um, it, it comes down to individual cases and, and taking the time to really Look at what are the um, what what's at the root of the issue and, and addressing it. Sarah, uh, I could yes. I would like to add to that because I I agree with you. I, I find that that is something that is is essential to make sure that the supports and the interventions are really personalized based on need. Mm -hmm. um, there has to be some flexibility. There has to be um, compassion. You have to build a relationship and a rapport because you're asking families to divulge some of their um, most emotionally raw things. Uh, you have to have courageous conversations to really um, engage families and you have to be respectful. 
that as educators and people who work with families and children on a daily basis, we tend to see things through a different lens. As a family, you don't always recognize the barriers that are the challenge. And right now, more than ever, we have families dealing with things they've never dealt with before. So it's not going to be obvious to them. So if you ask the question open-ended and say, well, what is causing your child not to come to school? It's very accusatory. It doesn't mm -hmm. make a family feel comfortable. You have to frame it in a way that is going to engage the family in thinking about what their daily schedule is or how their child's behaving and then what triggers those behaviors. So you really have to have very courageous conversations with compassion um, and support and, and sometimes make suggestions and have families think through. Um, so it helps to have mental health professionals working side by side with you. <clears throat> School counselors are a tremendous resource because they recognize a lot of the barriers that have um, impacted children in terms of attendance or academics um, and behavior. So the root cause analysis, I, I say, is one of the most valuable things, um, but it has to really dig into what are all of the contributing factors and barriers. And there are sometimes there can be multiple ones there, right? And you might maybe you've uncovered two, but there's still some remaining ones that need to be addressed. And I think what you said, Tiffany, is so important about the way that we approach our parents or our caregivers and making sure that it, it's, uh, you know, they want their children to be engaged and be attending school as well. It's so it's, it's recognizing that we're all working together to, to reach that goal. And uh, it's not a us versus them, but it's an a we approach and, and getting them involved and um, you know, approaching parents with, with empathy is really important. So I think that's such a, such a big piece. And I, I know we that can't, we can't just a, attack those superficial things mm -hmm. we really have to get into the, the complex and, and let's be honest, schools as organizations aren't set up um, to address all of the collective needs. So we are working on a very individualized and personalized approach to support those multiple layers of, of challenges. Yeah, and I'm glad that you mentioned school counselors. Sometimes school counselors can uh, meet with parents and, and be able to form that relationship with them um, in a different way than administrators possibly can. So, it, it, you know, encouraging school counselors or school social workers, school, school psychologists, uh, sometimes if it's a, bringing a new person into the conversation that maybe hasn't been there before, that can be a refreshing uh, start and it might help open some doors and, and um, the, get people the to the thing, table. The other thing I want to add to is, um, Tiffany, I know that you guys provide training to school staff, school teams, in terms of doing that root cause analysis and how to have those conversations and build relationships with the families. And, um, you know, I think that that has been very helpful in terms of, um, you know, providing those, you know, building those skill sets with the school teams. Yeah, because we each know our own reality. So we're going to instinctively think about the barriers and challenges that maybe we've had direct access to. And what we have to recognize is that, that the individuals we're working with have a completely different sense of reality. Um, and so it does take a lot of ongoing training and support um, feedback as administrators go through the process to help them ask, you know, what are the questions that you asked? Did you reflect on these? Have you considered this? I think that's important because, you know, we all have the opportunity to grow and recognize um, the experiences of, of others. And so it's that ongoing support that, that helps that grow. Awesome. And just looking at the time, um, I'm, I want to uh, just assure everyone that we will address all of the questions that were brought forward um, off camera and we'll share out those answers with all of those that registered um, after afterwards. So be on the lookout for that. And thank you to those that posed questions. There were some really amazing ones that were brought forward. So we want to address those um, at a later time. So thank you. And one of the key takeaways I have from today is really the amazing amount of collaboration. I definitely think that attendance is not a solo sport. Um, and given you know these times, we really have to be very creative and um, you know, uh, think outside the box basically. So um, even more collaboration is needed, whether it's internally making use of the various um, key stakeholders within the school, as well as community partners. Um, so um, thank you again to all of our presenters for sharing such wonderful information. Um, Dr. Sale, Sophia Almond, Tiffany Hardy, 
Heather Turman, Erica Schmale, Greg Hopkins, and Ed Holmes. Thank you so much for all of your um, uh, insights and examples of um, effective strategies and practices. And um, thank you to all the participa uh, participants for uh, attending the webinar today. I know that this is a really important topic and I know that we're all struggling with challenges in terms of how to ensure that students are feeling supported, families are feeling supported so that they can um, stay engaged and um, you know, continue to deal with uncertainties during these times. Thank you so much.